we have a lot to cover today, so um, I'm going to uh, go ahead and just get started. Um, except, okay. Um, I also wanted to uh, to to mention that um, I was sent a few of the installation shots. From, um, from the Hasselblad Center and the show look here. Um, I'm really pleased, especially with the color scheme because um, that's the kind of color scheme that Dwayne really likes. He does, he's not so crazy about just plain white walls. And I think that he'll, he would be very, very pleased to, um, to see the installation that, that you've done there. So we're going to talk about some of the portraits in the exhibition um, and other photographs too. And when I have, whenever I give a talk about Dwayne Michaels, I feel a certain responsibility uh, to accomplish something from the start, because I, as I said in the title, I know some of you are wondering who is Dwayne Michaels, um, and I can tell you that he is a household name among photographers in my generation. Uh, worldwide, uh, but not necessarily for younger photographers. And since we may have, uh, you know, students in the audience today, I really wanted to step back and um, and and really kind of address this. Um, uh, I think one of the ways of doing that is to look at this this wonderfully um, delightful person that you see on the screen right now. Um, and, and think about when he was getting started um, and how the world of photography, um, you know, existed at that point. Um, and, uh, and so let's just take a look here at some of the um, other photographers who were, uh, who were, well, some of the main photographers, really, the, 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 the legends like uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson, who made this image behind the Gare Saint-Lazare in, in Paris. And um, you might remember that um, Cartier-Bresson was really the champion of what we call the, what he called the decisive moment. Uh, and you can sort of see that um, at, on this screen. I mean, the decisive moment here would be where that man's heel is break, just about to break the surface of the water. If it had broken the surface of the water, well, that would be a completely different image. It's a very lyrical image with that beautiful reflection and all of the things that are happening in the background and so forth. All of that being the kind of decisive moment. In the United States, the main photographer in the 1950s, 60s, 70s really was Ansel Adams with, um, you know, known for his, his strong singular images, the end, and especially the, the perfect print. Uh, or uh, photographer W. Eugene Smith or other photojournalists um, who worked for Life magazine and others with amazing photo essays that told stories about events in the world. Remember, this was a time before every house had a television, much less a computer. They weren't even invented yet. Um, and then of course, the Swiss photographer, Robert Frank, who came to the United States, bought an old car, crossed the country, um, and really created this book and, uh, and a whole way of seeing. Um, it really defined an era, the, the, the personal documentary. Uh, Diane Arbus, who followed him, who, who photographed in her words, freaks, um, and who showed us a very personal approach to capturing her world, Gary Winogrand. Um, who's kind of quirky street photography um, in the 1960s and 1970s, in a way carried on the tradition of, of Robert Frank. So in the midst of all of this, uh, you had uh, someone like Dwayne Michaels. You had, um, you had uh, let me just go back to that one. You had, you had these amazing, uh, you know, the street pictures, you had, remarkable single images like you saw from Ansel Adams, beautiful prints. The print itself was really 
um, an object. It was it was something that was um, that was precious, truly precious, pristine. Um, and so uh, along came Dwayne Michaels, who you know that didn't really work for him. That idea of the singular image that didn't really work for him. The decisive moment, he said, not so much, not for me. He said, I needed the moment before sequences. And you see on the screen right now, the titles of four of his well-known sequences, really, they're sort of very well known to, to people in my generation. Um, but, uh, but I'm going to show them to you. And at a glance, I think you'll be able to see how different he was from the photographers that we just looked at. Let's look at Paradise Regained. So that was different. Telling a story with a series of pictures, not just one image, and presenting not only female nudity, but male nudity together. The spirit leaves the body. Michaels was clearly dealing with themes that were not common in the field of photography. Spirituality, that was not a typical topic. And using double exposures to tell a story, uh, real photographers didn't use double exposures. That was a kind of gimmicky, tricky thing, or so we thought in the 1950s and 1960s. Let's look at death comes to the old lady. So here you see an image or a sequence rather where death is the topic. Death is being described to us in a kind of poetic way, he was employing photographic techniques that were uncommon, very uncommon. Here, we talked about the double exposure. Here, he's using a long exposure to convey movement. And we'll finish with chance meeting, finish the sequences. Um, I, I really want to, um, to just emphasize that sometimes when I introduce a talk uh, for Dwayne Michaels, um, I, I cite his, uh, you know, 75 page resume or his, uh, his 100 solo exhibitions around the world, or the fact that his photographs are in most uh, permanent museum collections worldwide. But today I wanted to start with these sequences just to show you really what put him on the map. Um, Well-known photographers in New York reacted very negatively to all of these sequences when they first appeared. Uh, they were shown at the Museum of Modern Art. And those photographers essentially said, this is this is not photography. We can't take this seriously. Uh, you know, well, others who weren't so envious of his creativity saw something fresh and new, 
and in, in Yotavoya right now, that Dwayne Michaels, the portraitist, because you see his work being so challenging and creative to the world of photography, seemingly overnight, he was a kind of force to be reckoned with in the New York photographic world. And, uh, and it was because of that, that he got these fantastic assignments to, uh, to do portraits of famous people like uh, Andy Warhol, for example, uh, magazine editors, book publishers, newspaper picture editors, they all wanted a piece of this Dwayne Michaels magic. Um, so he was invited to make portraits of, of, um, of real celebrities or people who were on the verge, on the cusp of becoming celebrities like Meryl Streep. In 1975, she was just getting started and look how young and radiant she is here. Today, of course, we know her as one of the most celebrated actresses in the history of, of film. David Hockney, who was uh, photographed by Dwayne Michaels in 1975 when he was just a young artist. Annie Leibovitz, uh, the celebrity portrait photographer. Um, I just love the use of glasses here. Um, of course, Annie Leibovitz sees so famously herself. And now in this image, we get to see her through her own device. That's very clever on the part of Dwayne Michaels. Um, I'll probably say this many times as we go through the talk today, but he would come up with these ideas on the spot. Unlike Annie Leibovitz, who would, you know, if she was going to photograph someone, she would have three beaches reserved in California uh, to make sure that she had the right light for the, for the portrait session. She'd have an army of assistants and, you know, six loaded cameras and she'd take, you know, hundreds of shots. Um, uh, they couldn't be more different in terms of their approach. Uh, the, the police uh, with um, Sting, you can see Sting there in the middle, uh, in the middle row. Uh, he really wanted Dwayne Michaels to photograph the, the, the band uh, for their Synchronicity album. Or Branford Marsalis, um, uh, a jazz musician uh, for his album cover Scenes in the City. And, and uh, you know, that was a collage that was done very creatively well before the digital era. And here you see Andy Warhol again. Uh, Andy Warhol uh, and Dwayne Michaels were both born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, just four years apart. Uh, Dwayne is four years uh, younger than Andy would have been. Um, they both came from very humble backgrounds. Uh, they both uh, went on to become artists. They both ended up in New York City. Uh, and fortunately for us, um, uh, Dwayne Michaels uh, is still alive and well and, and uh, making wonderful things. So a few years ago, uh, the gallery that represents Dwayne, the DC Moore Gallery in New York, uh, organized an exhibition of his portraits. Uh, and that's when we learned that Dwayne thinks of portraiture in four specific ways. He calls them four sorts of portraits. So let's start by looking at what Dwayne called the stand and stare portraits. We'll look at five different examples of these. First of all, the sailor in Minsk. Um, Duane's first adventure with photography was when he decided to go to Russia in 1958. And that was in at the height of the Cold War, that Cold War, who knows where we're headed today. I, one of the things I thought of as I've been preparing this talk over the past few days is the desperate situation that the world seems to be finding itself in right now. And I just want everyone who's watching this talk to know that uh, Ukraine is heavy on our minds too. I live in Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh has an enormous Ukrainian uh, population because of the steel industry. Um, uh, my neighbors are Ukrainian, um, and they have family that they are very worried about in Ukraine right now. We're all worrying together. 
Uh, I don't want you to think that because we're so far away, we're not thinking of this, but uh, because it's heavy on our minds and hearts as well. But now in 1958 with Duane, um, we'll look at the children that he photographed in Leningrad. Um, and, you know, he was, he was there with a borrowed camera. Um, he really didn't even call himself a photographer yet. He didn't want to take a, 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 a light meter because he didn't want anyone to think he actually was a photographer. But this is a fantastic image and it shows his, his innate ability because he didn't ask the children to look up at him. He got right down at their level. Um, and it's, it shows that he has an, a kind of instinctive um, notion of how to use that borrowed camera. This couple, uh, you may not know, Charles Birchfield was a very um, famous uh, American painter, a visionary painter. And here he is pictured with his wife um, and so humble. I mean, this picture is as American as apple pie, as we say here. And it's so calm and they're so humble. And um, it's just, just a wonderful, wonderful sort of simple stand and stare portrait. Here's another one of, a, of another famous art couple. Um, this is Georgette and René Magritte, uh, the famous um, uh, surrealist artist. Duane was a great admirer of Magritte and was invited to um, uh, go photograph him in, in Brussels. It was Duane's initiative that made that happen. And, um, and he spent um, five days photographing him uh, in, in Brussels. Uh, and here they, they both stood behind a tree, uh, willing to participate in, in Duane's follies at the time. Um, and some of his stand and stare photographs became more complicated, like this one. Uh, Duane, again, being willing to sort of break the rules. Here he was, he's going to make an image with using a double exposure. Um, don't forget, in the pre-digital era, he didn't know what was going to come out on that negative until he developed it in the darkroom. He could have carefully calculated that placement and so forth, but there's no guarantee that it would come out exactly the way he wanted it to. And here, even a triple exposure. Uh, he was so influenced by Magritte uh, and Magritte's openness was refreshing for him. And, and Magritte, I think, was happy to participate in all of it. I think that's what we sort of see from these, um, from the, these uh, portraits of him. And finally, under the stand and stare, look at Liza Minnelli. Liza Minnelli is an American actress. Um, and I think this is really beautiful. It's just a beautiful portrait where you see uh, the, 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 those stairs, the shadow of the stairway. You see that whole sort of stairway motif being picked up on her striped dress, the shadow also falling on her hat. And what is illuminated here really is her eye. Um, it's a pretty straightforward portrait, but it shows so many things that the photographer was attentive to. Um, and this is something that he was attentive to when he got there and saw the light. Once I find my light, everything else is butter, he wrote in his portrait book. Um, and, and we'll see that so often in the, in the portraits ahead. So the next kind of portrait that we'll talk about is the annotated portraits. Duane said, I write my thoughts and observations about the sitter. I editorialize. So here are four of the annotated portraits that we'll look at, starting with uh, Philip Roth in the 1980s. Roth is a very well-known American author who was celebrated for novels, including Portnoy's Complaint, The Human Stain, and American Pastoral. Uh, you may not have read any of them. Um, it's okay. It's still a fascinating um, portrait. It's interesting to see how those doubly exposed faces intersect in the middle. Um, and I haven't read Portnoy's complaint either, or I did so long ago that I've forgotten it, but the annotation underneath is Roth's Portnoy's complaint. The mama's boy beats his meat. 
well, that's pretty mysterious. And so it might even be an incentive to us to go and find that book. The next portrait, we also see two faces of the sitter, not by double exposure this time, but using a reflection in a mirror, a great tool in a photographer's toolkit. Uh, Eartha Kitt, a uh, fantastic American singer, um, and he notated this photograph with, in Germany, I named my tank C'est Si Bon. Well, Duane was a lieutenant in the army in the 1950s and he was stationed in Germany, but it was after the war. And he's very lucky that he was in Germany and not in Korea because if, as he said, if he was in Korea, he probably wouldn't have come home again. So at the time when he was in Germany, C'est Si Bon was a very popular song um, and he loved it. And so he nicknamed his tank with C'est Si Bon. Um, when he was later, much later, in 2007, asked to make this portrait of Eartha Kitt, uh, he decided to annotate it with that memory of his. Uh, I encourage you to go to YouTube, uh, look up Eartha Kitt, and um, listen to her singing C'est Si Bon. It's, it's just incredible. Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash is a singer that you may well know, and maybe you even love his country music. Um, and Duane wrote at the bottom of this, Johnny Cash was hotter than a pepper sprout. Uh, wow, it's such a curious portrait. So let's, let's look at this a little bit. Um, Johnny Cash is sitting on a chair inside of a room. Duane, the photographer, is outside, not only outside, he was, he was outside the window, um, and we see his reflection in the window. Um, and thanks to the shadow of his reflection, we get to see the sitter, Johnny Cash. And what's very curious is that Johnny Cash's eyes appear to be looking at that man walking away across that parking lot, probably. Uh, but he wouldn't even be able to see that because that was behind Dwayne Michaels, who's standing on this balcony in front of that, that um, railing. So it's all very mysterious. It's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle, I guess, in a way. Um, it's a mystery that's a fun one that's, that, to solve as you're looking at it. Here's another look at the installation inside the Hasselblad Center with an enlargement of a contact sheet. And we're gonna look at that more closely. Here it is. So what is a contact sheet? Uh, I, I guess we have students in the audience who understand the analog system, um, and uh, that's good. So you know what a contact sheet is. But I was interviewed last fall by a writer for the Boston Globe, a young woman, who, um, who said, Linda, what is a negative? And I thought, oh, wow, that's so incredible. Uh, that's a long story, um, but briefly, uh, for those of you who also might be wondering that, uh, before the digital era, photography was so much harder for the photographer. Um, for many decades, really, the most important kind of photography was the negative pro positive process since the 1830s, in fact. Film was inserted into a camera, but in dark conditions, either in a sheet holder or in a little roll um, and the film was exposed and then it was taken out of the camera also in the dark and then it was taken into a dark room and that's where it was developed and then after the film was developed and dry it would be put together with a piece of photographic paper exposed to light and this is what you would get you would get what's called a contact sheet this shows the photographer what he or she managed to get on the roll of film. Because before that, before that step, the photographer didn't know what was on the, it's not like looking at your little, you know, iPhone and seeing, oh, what was that? I'll, no, I'll do another one. Um, so here you can see that the contact sheet is kind of marked up. It's sort of worn away now, but the lower left corner, there are some red wax markings showing us that the image there is probably the one that Dwayne Michaels liked the best. And sure enough, that's the one that is in 
the exhibition, the way she was, that's when Barbara Streisand was a young star on Broadway. And here's another, sec a, a second contact sheet. <coughs> so we know that he exposed at least two rolls of film, but because we see double exposures and triple exposures and single exposures, we know that he took more than, than 24 pictures. They just happen to be sort of stacked one on top of another. So um, here in this instance, we can, uh, we can see the red markings at the, the top and, uh, and that shows us what the picture was that he chose from that particular contact sheet. Uh, and the annotation here is, uh, the funny girl arrived with three shopping bags of dowdy dresses and, pre and pretended to be secondhand rows. Bingo. Well, this comment is directly connected to the, the song secondhand rose song famous in the 1960s. Another performer, Fanny, Fanny Bryce, had made it famous in the 1920s, but, um, but, but uh, she has revived the song. And before I leave this slide, I just want to make note of something that you've seen quite a lot now but it, it's important to mention, and Christopher even mentioned it in his introduction, Duane is writing directly on the photographic print. Uh, that was taboo. That was completely unforgivable. Real photographers didn't do that. Serious photographers didn't do that. So here again, Dwayne is, is setting himself apart from the photographers who were really famous at the time. Let's look at the next kind of um, portrait. And I can hardly believe that so much time has gone by. I'm gonna go much more quickly now. Um, the, the prose portraits, a prose portrait tells the story of a person. The sitter becomes the hero of their tale and something about their nature revealed in the plot. So here we've got uh, five different photographer uh, artists that he photographed. Joan Didion was a famous um, uh, writer in California. We're going to move through these somewhat quickly. Dennis Hopper, an actor, uh, director of the film Easy Rider. Even if you don't like smoking, I think it's hard to resist this beautiful image. Joseph Cornell, a surrealist creator of little boxes. And you can see that Dwayne has got him sort of right in the middle of a little box of light here. Um, fortuitously, he moved during the exposure, which is what gives us that sort of very curious profile. Uh, and here we have um, the creative director of Condé Nast, um, uh, Grace Coddington, uh, beautifully photographed here with all of those mirrors. And again, I suggest to you that this was probably assembled when Duane arrived to make her portrait. And there's Duane in his apartment in New York and behind him is a silkscreen by Chuck Close that Duane would have used as inspiration for this portrait that he made of Chuck Close. Um, and uh, it's really, uh, quite a quite a, an intriguing portrait of a very famous photographer. The imaginary portraits uh, are a lot of fun. Here you have Duane painting on tintypes. Uh, there was a time when he decided he wanted to spend some time painting. Um, and so he collected these oversized tintypes and albumen prints and he used oil paint and added to it. Here you have the redhead, Margaret and Eleanor, and Margaret and Eleanor, that's the name of his mother and his, his aunt, 
that's not his mother and aunt, but he used, they seem to look like sisters. And there I've included a little shot that I took in Duane's uh, home in New York City. This is where he did these painted portraits. He, he carved out a space for himself in this little closet-like room off of, um, off of one of the rooms in his, in his home. And he was able to really focus and do these whimsical pieces that you'll see in the exhibition the musician and the magician. And here you can see he's adding dice and flags and the uh, ace of clubs and, and other objects. Mrs. Dalloway uh, was a, a, a favorite book of his by um, Virginia Woolf. And um, he was really, it was a personality that stayed with Duane. So he interpreted that as he did with Swan's Way. This is a tin type uh, with applied oil paint too. And, you know, apparently Marcel Proust who wrote the great French, um, you know, novel that went on for uh, seven books, I guess, A la recherche du temps perdu. Uh, he, um, he interpreted Marcel Proust's notion of time as not being linear. And I think it's a very creative, uh, interpretation of that. Now we're going to the country. This was Duane's country home. I was there visiting in, 19, in 2013. Um, and I arrived just as the painters, the house painters were right at the top of that ladder, thought it was a fortuitous moment. Um, Duane and his husband, Fred, had this beautiful um, place in Northern New York State. Wayne gave me a tour of the garden and you can see the pond in the back. He knew the names of all the flowers. Um, and look at that little gazebo back there because you're going to now see that in the next images where we discover that Dwayne created yet another um, form, uh, something else, a different shape. He did a whole series of the four seasons at his country home using that fan shape, winter, spring, summer, and fall. And he did a number of, of uh, images using that fan shape. Like you see, this one is in the exhibition, in the season of their passion. He would often photograph beautiful women and beautiful men. Uh, Duane was uh, an openly gay artist um, he celebrated well-known homosexual writers and painters, and so it's not uncommon to see him address beauty, female beauty, male beauty in his um, images. Let's take a quick trip to New York City. Um, I would take a, a nine-hour Amtrak train. I probably took it 20 times to, to visit Duane when we were working on the Storyteller exhibition. Uh, I'd get to New York and I would meet Dwayne. We'd go to a restaurant together and um, it was just wonderful to be able to see him again uh, and to work together. But it was always a challenge. I'd arrive at his home, his beautiful home. And, um, and you can see here the door. I'd go in there and Dwayne would open the door to this very crowded room that was full of junk, really. I mean... Uh, an old dish drainer, uh, pots and, and, and brown paper and who knows what. I had no idea it was in there. I could barely get my suitcase in the door. Um, well, luckily for us, uh, Dwayne hired an assistant, Josiah Cunio, and there you see him approaching Dwayne's um, place. Uh, well, he was the mag magician, really. Um, Josiah cleaned that room and he put order in it. He organized everything. He discovered what was there. He threw out the junk. And honestly, all the portraits that are, we're talking about today, the portraits that are in the exhibition, 50% of them were hidden in that room before Josiah applied his magic to it. Um, and so they're rediscovered now. It's fantastic uh, that we have been able to to bring these things back. This is a picture that I took of Duane when he came to visit Pittsburgh a few years ago. 
Uh, here he is pictured in front of one of our last steel mills that you can see USS United States Steel back there. Uh, it's very nostalgic for Duane to come back to, um, to Pittsburgh. Uh, he grew up here, I mentioned his father was a steel worker um, and he left 70 years ago, but he loves the city. Uh, he comes back, uh, well, he used to come back somewhat regularly until the pandemic. Um, he photographs it when he comes and the last time I was with him here, uh, he used his pictures to create this very fun image, his hooray for Pittsburgh. Um, so what has he been doing since 2015 when I saw him? I'll quickly just show you that he's been having exhibitions um, in Madrid uh, or in Barcelona, another retrospective in Barcelona, a, a, a Spanish fashion uh, luxury fashion house called Lowe uh, commissioned him to photograph their entire line uh, one year. They did this beautiful limited edition catalog of the, of the fashions, which Dwayne generously gave me a copy of. Um, this is the back cover. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any fashion here because the models are nude, but inside the covers of the book, there are some clothes. He always wanted to photograph Tilda Swinton, and, um, and here he finally did. Um, uh, she came to New York. He managed to arrange a, a session with her. He thought of her as just being this enigmatic film star and with a kind of Gar Greta Garbo-like uh, presence. So he met her in her hotel room with his assistants. He didn't like the light, uh, so one of his assistants got a a room uh, closer to the top or on the top of the of the hotel and uh, this is one of the uh, portraits that he made mr backwards forwards and then he did this one which he called sybil uh, he actually brought some veils with him she was covered with five veils and then she took off one and then she was covered with four and he made and he made a series of five of them where the veils were coming off and all of this is in the portrait book um and a sibyl he called her a sibyl because a sibyl is a clairvoyant uh someone who can really see into the future um and uh he just felt enormously gratified once he was at able to capture her and this is what he wrote she whispered and uh, finally and very very quickly christopher i promise um i just want to show you that over the past two years during uh, two or three times a week that i'm on the bcc you can see he sends it to his fans his friends family fans uh dear all do not pet the poison ivy mr green thumb uh and so there's a pdf and we open the pdf and we get treated to what Dwayne has done today or what Dwayne has done in the last two days. He's drawing, he's looking back through old photographs, he's revisiting things that, uh, that moments from the country, he's writing new text pieces, putting words in them that he can handwrite because the evidence of the hand has always been very important to Dwayne. Uh, here you see the first prize award for their flowers at the Cambridge garden show. So there's another, um, another message that arrived a month later, omnibus, suddenly a summer shower, I am watered like a flower. I don't regret being wet, because I blossom for an hour. We love to write little poems that rhyme. It's really something that, uh, so he's bringing up some more of his fan images. And this one with all of the sunflowers reminded him, of course, of Vincent van Gogh, wandered into a field of sunflowers with a ladder. He leaned it against a cloud and climbed to heaven. So I guess what I'm showing you here, and I'll just talk over this as you see it, is that Duane is 90 years old. He turned 90 last month. He is still on fire. He is completely active, very busy, creating new work virtual, not virtually, literally every day um, and sending it far and wide. He said, you know, he always, he always wanted a gallery. 
um, and he always had really good galleries um, and still does. But, um, but what he loves about social media is that all the stuff that he creates, he can just share with people. And so that's what he loves doing now. Uh, and I think that that brings us to the end of, of our talk. I'll go back to that. Um, I'll go back to that picture of Duane so that we have something more interesting to look at. Um, and I'm sorry that that was so speeded up at, at the end, but uh, I realized that I was, as usual, getting carried away and talking more than I should. So um, I guess maybe if there are any questions, if we have uh, any questions, people can put them into the chat or, uh, or send a, I'm not quite sure what, what is um, what the next step is here, but uh, uh, hello, Stefan. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much, Linda, for an interesting and engaging lecture about a very remarkable artist and photographer. Thank you very much. And yeah, like Linda said, we can open up for some questions from the audience, if there's any. Uh, so you can either raise your hand or you sprite in the Q&A. Um, Otherwise, I've got, I've, I've got a little question for you, Linda. I was just wondering yeah. if you could elaborate a little bit on your own connection with uh, Dwayne. How, how did you get to know him? Well, well, thank you for asking that question, actually, Stefan. Um, I was a young photographer myself in the 1970s living in Portugal. And I, I, um, I subscribed to a magazine from England called Creative Camera. And, um, and one day this magazine arrived and it, was, it had a feature on Dwayne Michaels. And, and I looked at these sequences, I couldn't believe it. I thought that was just astonishing. And, um, and so uh, I, I, am, I immediately um, thought I have, to, I have to pay attention to this guy. I have to follow his work, which I did for 40 years. And then, um, well, in the 1990s, my husband got a job in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon University and we were moving um, to Pittsburgh. And I thought, oh, I think Dwayne Michaels was from Pittsburgh. And when I came to Pittsburgh, um, I was eventually hired as the curator at Carnegie Museum of Art. And, and my first assignment was to work with Dwayne Michaels. And um, so I, I contacted him in New York. And I... And I said, I, I'm supposed to do a big exhibition about you. Um, so let me come and let's, let's meet and let's, let's see what we can do. And so I started going to visit him, you know, three or four times a year uh, in New York. And, um, and, 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 and really, I feel very, very close to him now. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that we haven't been able to see each other in the past couple of years because of travel restrictions, but but uh, I look forward to going to see him again sometime soon, hopefully. We have a, a, a question in the chat, um, and I'll just read it out. Do you have a favorite image or series by Dwayne Michaels? I have about a hundred, um, uh, so that would be hard to uh, hard to say, but um, actually, um, uh, when, well, I, I love all of the sequences that I showed. Those are all my favorites because those were the early ones and those were the ones that, that, that really put him on the map. Um, there is one that I did not show that's called the Boogeyman. And I don't know whether you have any idea what a boogeyman is, but a boogeyman is a monster in your bedroom when you're a little child. And, um, and, and everyone, I think when you're a child, there's a boogeyman in the closet or there's a boogeyman down the hall, you're afraid of something. And Dwayne did a whole sequence about that. And, um, 
And so that's that's one of my real favorites. It wasn't one that I included because it's a it's a little bit later, but um, yeah. But I mean, of the portraits, of the portraits that are in the exhibition, honestly, there are so many that are just masterful in terms of how how successful they are in um, in giving us not only the person photographed, but a beautiful sense of the photographer and the photographic skills that were used in making that portrait. And that's that's what I, I you know was trying to point out in the in the talk that Dwayne just has an enormous bag of tricks, you know, he just, he uses, and he, and he refuses to be, he refuses to be um, bound by rules. He's just not interested. He's just not interested. He says, uh, I want to, I want to tell this in five pictures. I don't want to tell it in one picture. I'm going to do it my way. Forget it. I don't care. Um, and I really admire that because that's true to him. And he's, he's been like that for 70 years. So <laughs> it works. <laughs> I, have Is there another? Um, I have a question around that, actually. So because his work seems, um, I mean, it's very contemporary um, in comparison to the earlier kind of traditions that you showed at the same time. So I'm wondering, like, was the resistance to his work? Like, how, how was it received? How, how were the conversations going? Well, it was such a dichotomy because the, you know, the, the really successful photographers at the time, you know, people, people like Joel Meyerowitz and Gary Winogrand and, you know, um, the, 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 the hot shots, uh, uh, they said, don't pay attention to that. That's just, that's just crap. That's, that's a flash in the pan. You know, that's not photography. That's not real. Uh, you know, so what, who cares? That's just, that's just silly. Um, and so there was huge resistance to it by um, by famous photographers of the time, but the public loved it. Public loved it, which is why you had these, um, you know, you had all these assignments. Dwayne was moving so fast, making all of these, getting these assignments. He didn't even remember them. He didn't remember that he'd done all of these. I was really angry with him when Josiah cleaned that room because he found all those portraits that Dwayne never told me about. He had forgotten about them. He didn't remember that he had photographed David Hockney. <laughs> he didn't remember that he'd photographed some of these hugely important people. And, um, and, you know, so he, uh, he was, he, he, he was just, he was just so busy. And, and the other thing, and I forgot to mention this, and I want to mention this, among art photographers, this happens a lot. Among art photographers, they say, oh, I don't, oh, I don't do commercial work. I don't do assignments because I'm an artist. I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lower myself to do a, to do a commercial job. Um, Dwayne said, that's ridiculous. Uh, I, I, I do all of it. I, I, I have to live for one thing. So I'm, I, I'm gonna do a job and get paid for it so that I can then do my personal work. And, you know, and eventually, Dwayne was getting a lot of plenty of money for both things. But um, but you know, another thing that I learned from Dwayne, I, I'm I've I've never I've been a curator primarily, not a photographer. But um, one of the tips that that uh, that I want to share with anyone in your audience who thinks that they might go out to to do some some if they're ever asked if you're asked 
to, um, to do an assignment. Eventually they will, the, the topic of payment will come up and you, the photographer are wondering, how much can I ask to do this job, right? And Dwayne has always said, when, when, when the people giving him an assignment say, what is your fee? His answer is, what is your budget? What, is, what, what have you got? What do you have budgeted for this job? And then they would say an amount that was always much more than Dwayne would feel like he could ask. So it was a strategy on his part, um, and it and it and it, it it it's a very useful technique, I think. <laughs> we have a question in the Q and A from uh, from Nana. Uh, is his work always exhibited in a small format, or does he ever work on a bigger scale? Do you know the thoughts behind the small size of the prints? That's a really good question. Dwayne does not like big photographs. He believes in the intimacy of small prints. In fact, um, most of his most of his sequences, I'm in the wrong room. I don't have the most of his sequences, the, the prints are this big. So so if you have six pictures in the sequence, you have frames that are like this and you have a little row of prints. And so as a viewer, you must go very close and get very intimate with the subject, with the, with the image. Um, he is very critical about the this here the Gerskis and the Struths and the the photographers who make these great huge enlargements. He he firmly believes bigger is not better. Bigger is not better, and it's it's so he just he loves little he loves little photographs. Now the the portraits in the exhibition are not this size. They're, they're kind of more of a standard size, uh, eight by 10 or 11 by 14 inches, something like that. Um, so that's okay. But he does not do billboard size um, photographs. Not at all. We have another question in the Q&A. Um, did Duane ever meet opposition in the art world being a queer artist exploring male beauty? Good question. Um, he certainly did. Um, uh, and he, um, Duane and Fred uh, led a very quiet life. They were not flamboyant gay people who would go in parades, you know, gay pride parade and that sort of thing. He was, a, they lived like an, like a, a an old fashioned couple uh, on a, you know, I don't know, in, in a, in a simple house. I mean, they, they just were um, very kind of, they, you know, read their books, went to plays, uh, went to movies, went, you know, for walks and, and garden. They loved gardening. Um, uh, but he was, um, he was, he had such a wonderful, uh, there's one wonderful book, and I think you may have it in your library, about when, when Duane was in the army, uh, in Germany, that's when he really dis when he really realized that he was gay, um, and uh, so that was a complete shift for him in his life. He was already in his twenties, you know, when when that happened. I mean, he he in retrospect he could look back and see that he had you know suppressed that, but but um, but so so he he's he in the same vein as we've been talking, Dwayne was was Duane is is still determined to be true to himself 
And so he, uh, he, he, if, if people wouldn't accept him as gay, that's their problem, not his problem. Um, and he really was one of the first photographers to, to open doors in that regard. Fortunately, he found some sympathetic gallery directors and publishers who would, you know, who would agree with the publication of some of these things. He has beautiful works about, and, and entire books um, about, you know, the, the, about gay artists um, and, um, and really the celebration of, 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 of a life of being true to yourself. There's a wonderful film about Dwayne called Dwayne Land. Um, there are several films about Dwayne, but Dwayne Land, in Dwayne Land, Dwayne is meeting with a, a class of kids in a high school. And they ask him, are you married? And he says, no, I'm gay. And they all erupt in laughter. Because this is in high school. Oh my God. Oh my God. Then he just says, well, there are, you know, there are different kinds of, of love there that, you know, says, takes a matter of fact. And yeah, yeah, next question. Uh, so then he just like wants to move on. Uh, yeah, no, it's really, he, he's, he's, he's very comfortable, obviously at his age, um, but he, he helped a lot of gay artists, especially young gay photographers who, who, um, who, you know, felt comfortable with his work. I think we've got a, uh, a hand raised as well. Um, Mina, you're more comfortable with the webinar format. Okay. Yeah. Stefan, you can, you can talk in the audience. You can ask okay. Uh, hello to everyone. Uh, Mrs. Um, uh, I, 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 uh, I am uh, overwhelmed by the information uh, you, you told us. Uh, I discovered um, Dwayne Michaels, when uh, uh, my, my discover of him was uh, with sequences, and I uh, was blown away literally. Uh, I was wondering, did he spend some time um, thinking of the way he will uh, he will uh, um, show his uh, his ideas, or um, he just uh, made the pictures? the way it, they came out instinctively, I, I presume <laughs> would be the term, because the, the, the pictures, the photographs uh, uh, seem to me to be in a, in a row, let's, let's uh, call. What, what can you tell, uh, tell us about this? Well, your question is a really good one. I can remember when I asked him that question, uh, and and I think a lot of people want to know the answer to that question. Um, he um, he 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 would do a lot of preparation in his mind. Um, you know, imagine um, imagine, for example, chance meeting. That's one of the, his better known sequences. It's one that I showed you. That did not just happen. That was completely staged. That was completely set up. He had those two men in an alley in New York and they were, you know, spaced. Up. He had that in his brain of, of how that story would be told. Um, and so even though it looks spontaneous, it wasn't at all spontaneous. The same is true for um, Death Comes to the Old Lady. Death Comes to the Old Lady, that is actually his sequence. 
And so that was very, very staged. He is his grandma, who essentially raised Dwayne in many respects. He she would do whatever he wanted. And she she was asked, sit in this chair and look at the camera. And then his father was asked to come out of the other room and come towards the camera and let's do it again and let's do it again and let's try this and let's try that and then at, at a certain point his grandma was asked to just stand up and he would do a long exposure while she was standing up um and so i think we when we look at them we re we read them almost as a little film like oh this was just oh this was this was the action but of course it had to be very 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 premeditated um to to be able to come together like that now duane is um he hates perfectionism uh, and, and he, he, so a lot of them and they have lots of the words and he cross leaves that that shows a human side um, to all of it. So, so his sequences are more believable for us because sometimes they are imperfect. And um, and he's a master. He's just a master at that. I'm so glad that you um, asked that question. Thank you. All right. Thank um, you. Do you have any more questions, Stefan? Do you have any question? No, that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you so much, Linda, for joining us today and talking about Queen Michael's and sharing your knowledge and experiences with his work with us. It was great, and thank you to the audience um, for all the questions, and to HTK Valand for hosting the event. Um, yeah, perfect. Well, thank you all, really. I, I, I so wish I could be there with you. Dwayne would love to be there with you, uh, and maybe there will be another time, who knows. I, I hope the exhibition goes well, uh, I hope you have lots of visitors and um, and and I hope I've been able to share some interesting information with you. So it was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. There's, and all the, also there's lots of thanks in the chat in case you've missed that. Okay, wonderful. Great. <laughs>